And I titled this morning's message, Faithful Until He Delivers in the End. And so uh, we're going to start reading in Numbers 13, verses 1 through 4. I will tell you that this morning is a lot of scripture. And, uh, and, and you know, I want to break down the scripture. And uh, so just bear with me. I mean, some people really love le reading uh, Bible passages. I came from a church where... They talked about the fact that you, like, whenever you go to these preaching classes, they're like, oh, man, you ought not read that much of the Bible. And, and, and you know, because it kind of, like, puts people to sleep. Me and my sister out here were talking out in the parking lot about the seeker-sensitive movement, trying to do everything you can to make everybody happy. And that's not what Paul told young Timothy. Paul told Timothy, give public attention to the reading of Scripture. Amen? And so it's important that we stay strict Scripture-focused in our preaching. But uh, we'll let the Lord teach and preach this morning. Amen. Lord, we need you to be the preacher and teacher. All right. Numbers 13, starting in verse 1. And we're gonna, after we get through 4, we're going to skip to 17. Okay? It says, And the Lord spoke unto Moses, saying, Send thou men, that they may search the land of Canaan, which I give unto the children of Israel. Of every tribe of their fathers shall you send a man, every one a ruler among them. And Moses, by the commandment of the Lord, sent them from the wilderness of Paran. All those men were heads of the children of Israel, and these were their names. Now you can go ahead and skip to verse 17. We're not going to go through all the tribes. But essentially, Moses, under the inspiration of the Lord, said, I want you to send leaders of each tribe out into the land to spy out the land that I'm going to give you. So God's saying, I'm going to give you this land. This is your inheritance that I'm giving you. This is a promise I'm making to you. I'm going to give you this land. And I want you to go spy it out to see if it's a good land. And that's what he's about to talk about. And we're going to read all the way through verse 33 here. It says, And Moses sent them to spy out the land of Canaan, and said unto them, Get you up this way southward, and go up into the mountain, and see the land, what it is, and the people that dwell therein, whether they be strong or weak, few or many. And what the land is that they dwell in, whether it be good or bad. And what cities they be that they dwell in, whether in tents or in strongholds. And what the land is, whether it be fat or lean, whether there be wood therein or not. And be ye of good courage, and bring of the fruit of the land. Then it says, now the time was the time of the first ripe grapes. I want you to think about those grapes, because I'm going to talk about grapes throughout the message. So they went up and searched the land from the wilderness of Zin unto Rehob, as men come to Hamath. And they ascended by the south and came unto Hebron, where Ahamin, Sheshai, and Talmiah, the children of Anak, were. Now Hebron was built seven years before Zoan in Egypt. Now, that seems a little strange to have that little parenthetical verse there that just, oh, by the way, Hebron was built seven years before Zoan in Egypt. I mean, if you're reading, it's kind of like, okay, what's the point here? Well, what they just introduced, if you don't know that, I'm going to go ahead and take the time to explain this real quick. They just introduced the sons of Anak, three of them. If you don't know anything about the sons of Anak, that doesn't mean anything to you. But it's important, I believe, in the context of the overall scripture that you understand some things. So he named these three sons, and Anak is, is, was a famous giant of the day. And those were his three sons, so they themselves were giants. Hebron later on is going to be taken by Caleb because Caleb believed God and believed Amen. that God could give him the deliverance and give him the land. And so that's probably what the, the little parenthetical point is, is that, hey, this is the one that the giants lived in. This is the place where the three boys dwell. But later on, you're going to hear in the story, if you keep reading, we're not going to read it today, but I'm telling you about it. Caleb took that land through the power of God. Amen. And the giants that once stood there, they fell under the power of God. Amen. Now, where these giants come from real quick, I'm not going to really go on and on about it. We've taught this in detail in this church. In Bible college, they don't even teach you this. They're scared to talk about this kind of thing because it seems too sci-fi or too supernatural. But it's real clear, and I can prove it from the Scriptures, especially in the New Testament. I can absolutely prove it from the New Testament that this happened. That there were fallen angels that cohabited with the daughters of men. What does that mean? They produced offspring. They were called Nephilim. And that they were angels. Uh, I'm sorry, that they were giants that were in the land. Now, that may seem crazy to you, but I'm here to tell you that uh, George Lucas that made Star Wars didn't think it was that crazy because that's where he got the story. That's why the guy's called Anakin Skywalker. But that's another story for another time. Uh, but what I want you to know is, is that, that what was, that's what was going on there. That was who was inhabiting the land was these giants. Okay, And so it goes on to say it was built seven years before Zoan in Egypt. And they came into the brook of Eshkol. 
and cut down from there a branch with one cluster of grapes. And they bear it between two upon a staff. And they brought up the pomegranates and of the figs. The place was called the brook of Eschol because of the cluster of grapes. And so we see here that the idea is that it's the time of the first ripe grapes. They wanted, they were supposed to bring back. And I can tell you right now that this is Joshua and Caleb probably cutting this down. I mean, the Bible doesn't tell us that, but they're the only ones that end up going back with a good report. And they're like, hey, Moses told us to bring some fruit back. Look at this cluster of grapes right here. I mean, this thing was so big. They had to cut it down and they had to tie it to a pole and two men had to carry it. And they brought it back with them to Moses to show him, hey, this is what's growing over there. This is what is in the land that God has promised to give us. This is evidence that this is a land that's worth taking. Amen? Amen. And so, which the children of Israel cut down from there. And they returned from searching of the land after 40 days. And they went and came to Moses and to Aaron and to all the congregation of the children of Israel unto the wilderness of Paran to Kadesh. And brought back word unto them and to all the congregation and showed them the fruit of the land. And they told him and said, we came unto the land whither thou sentest. And surely it flows with milk and honey. And this is the fruit of it. Nevertheless, the people be strong that dwell in the land. And the cities are walled and very great. And moreover, we saw the children of Anak there. The Amalekites dwell in the land of the south. And the Hittites and the Jebusites and the Amorites dwell in the mountains and the Canaanites dwell by the sea and by the coast of Jordan. Just real quick, I want to stop and just say this. Within each one of those people groups that God named, there were, I guess I would call them nests of these Nephilim, these giants. There weren't, the whole land wasn't filled with giants, but there were nests or patches that dwelled in each one of these people groups. And so everywhere that they went to go uh, explore, <coughs> they're seeing these giants. Now, I'm just showing you like a little map. I know I draw it sometimes. Sea of Galilee, Jordan River, Dead Sea. This area here is Israel. This is Mount Carmel. This is the northern part. This little notch is Mount Carmel. This would be Jerusalem down here. Uh, in the south and so all of this the northern part would be later on called Israel the southern part would be called Judah down here in the south but the, but the point is is that this is the land of Canaan before it was named Israel okay and this is the land that God is promising to give to them and right now this is long before uh, well this is after the exodus this is whenever uh, the exodus, but they're wandering in the wilderness and God is promising them that he wants to give them this land as an inheritance and as a possession that belongs to them. Not because it belongs to them, but because it belongs to God and God wants to give it to his people. And, but, but I want you to understand something right now. The land is inhabited by the enemy of God. <laughs> It's not in, it's not under the, the dominion or, or under the way that God intended for it to be. What I want you to know about that is, is that this world that we currently live in is not in the way that God intended it to be. But that because of the fall and because of Adam giving into the serpent, he gave the dominion that God gave him to the enemy and allowed him to have power to usurp authority or to hold authority over this world that we live in. Well, what does that have to do with me, preacher? Well, it has a lot to do with you. It's called sin. And it's called the power of sin. And it's called the power of evil. And everything that you face in your life in the physical realm in a negative chaotic sense in some way, especially for the child of God, is, is determined in the spiritual realm as the enemy of your soul wants to, influ wants to exert influence spiritually in your life. And it's manifest in a chaotic sense. Now, the, in your physical life, whether it be things that go on at work, you get into it. I mean, I'm just trying to break it down into uh, at, at where we live. You know, when we're at work and there's a particular employee that we live, that we work with that acts the fool and that no matter what you try to do and you feel in your heart that we're trying to live for the Lord, but we're trying to do the right thing and, we're, you know, we're showing up and doing a job, but nevertheless, we're hounded by this person. It almost seems like they hate us. Now, we got to check our own selves, right? we got to look in the mirror to make sure that it's not our own personality and our own issues that are causing this problem. Lord knows Matt's had to do that. But at the same time, 
Sometimes, no matter how hard you try to get along with other people, there's something against you and you don't understand it. And maybe it's because Amen. you're living for the Lord and you desire to take a stand, what I'm trying to say. Or in your relationships. The enemy wants to destroy relationships. He wants to destroy your job. He wants to break your stuff. He wants to get you frustrated and, and, and disturbed in your spirit. And he wants to persecute you and frustrate you and aggravate you to the point... Well, you're not going to move forward, right? That's right that's and right. so I just wanted you to realize that this is a problem for God. But God's allowing his people to take a stand to do what he's asking them to do. Mm -hmm. You know, that's one of the things that I realized. Jesus, when he died on the cross, accomplished the will of God and defeated the forces of evil and defeated Satan. Yet God has allowed this church age process or even, even in the Old Testament because the fall took place much longer before that. Even in the Old Testament, God is allowing his people to live it through. The point that I guess I'm trying to make is it's kind of like maybe this is a bad analogy for women. But in a football game, coach is game planning. He's got certain plays built for this particular defense or this particular offense, right? We've got the plan. And in the coach's mind, the game is already won. But guess what? We've got to put the players on the field and actually allow it to take place. In a similar fashion, God has already won. The war is already won, yet there are battles and skirmishes that take place between the people of God and the forces of evil through the power of the Lord. We're walking and operating in His victory. It's not your victory. It's not your strength. It's not your wisdom. It's the work of the Lord that He's already accomplished, amen, and He's already won, and yet now if we'll believe it. See, that's what God wanted them to do. Believe me. Trust me, I'm going to give you the land. And if we will believe it, then the Lord is going to show up through the power of the Holy Spirit. In the New Testament, it's called grace to strengthen us and to empower us to walk the daily life and to do what it is that God has called us to do. What are you struggling with today? You don't have to raise your hand and answer me. Everybody in here is going through something. Every single person, even you, Maddox, as young as you are, you're going through something. The oldest person in here, the youngest person in here, going through something in their life. Well, the point that I'm trying to make to all of, about all of that is this. Spiritual versus physical. Right. You see, the way Dad would have told me to handle that is pop him in the jaw. Well, that's me in my flesh trying to handle something in my own physical nature, right? Robert told me a story about one time whenever he didn't mind me saying this, whenever they were in prison and there was this one dude that told his friend, man, I'm, I'm, the word got out that he was going to shank him or something like that. So the next thing you know, the dude's got like this special glove he got made and Robert's like, what you going to do with that? Because they were believers. He said, I'm about to take matters into my own hands. And Robert was like, I don't think you're supposed to do it that way. You're supposed to trust the Lord. Well, anyway, he took matters into his own hands and by the grace of God, it all worked out. But my point is this. Is that that's not how God wants us to handle things. And sometimes when we see things in the physical that are taking place in our life, we don't realize that it's something spiritual behind the scenes yeah. causing it. Yeah. And what we have to do is wrap our minds around the fact that it doesn't matter how young we are or how old we are. If we will ask God to intervene, he will give us the victory that amen. we need in our lives. He told Israel, amen, that I will go before you and I will give you this land. Because guess what? This is my land. This is my property. It belongs to my son. He spoke it forth with the power of the word of his mouth. It belongs to him. And one day he's going to rule and reign over it again. And his people that trusted him and believed him and lived for him are going to live with him. Amen. Amen. And, and, but in the meantime, he's put us in the battle. Because he's, what a beautiful thought if you think about that. I mean, if you ever played sports, you wanted to get in the game. I can tell you that. The last thing you want to do is ride the bench. You don't want to be on the bench. I wouldn't even sit on the bench. I'd be over there bugging the coach. Put me in coach. Put me in coach. Put me in coach. Because you want to be in the game. Think about the fact that God has prepared this whole situation. This is the way I see it. Just for the purposes of allowing a people that he created to partake in his plan and to be a part of what it is that he's doing. Amen. You, you know, nothing feels better than to be part of something you, and that you're and that you're doing what it is that you're supposed to do and that you see it come to pass. Amen? Amen. And that's what we have the hope of. We have the hope of being part of God's game plan. Now, listen, you know, I say all of these things because it's important that we understand who are we living for? I mean, really think about it. Who are we living for each and every day that we're living our lives? Are we living our lives for the Lord with these concepts in our mind? That God has put us here for a purpose. 
that, that Israel was here for a purpose, that God's people are here for a purpose, or are we so fixated on our own daily, day-to-day -day lives that we forget the big picture of God and that we forget what we're really here for, yeah. to be his people, yeah. to be separated unto the Lord, separate from the world, to be a light in the midst of darkness, to allow those around us to see the goodness of God. Why? So they too can come into the family of God and be part of the big plan of God. Amen? All right. Amen. So that was God's uh, desire that they would go in and take the land. And I think... Uh, I had stopped when I described all those people because the Canaanites well by the sea. And the main point, I know I said a lot of words, but the main point I wanted to make with all that is, is that this is God's property. Amen. This is God's land. We're God's property. Amen. And he wants his people to go in and take a piece of it. Amen. 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 And he still wants people today to go in and That's take right. a piece of it. Amen. All right. Canaanites dwell by the sea and by the coast of Jordan. And Caleb stilled the people before Moses and said, let us go up at once and possess it, for we are well able to overcome it. But the men that went up with him said, We be not able to go up against the people, for they are stronger than we. And they brought up an evil report of the land, which they had searched unto the children of Israel, saying, The land through which we have gone to search it is a land that eats up the inhabitants thereof. And all the people that we saw in it are men of a great stature, and there we saw the giants, the sons of Anak, which come of the giants. And we were in our own sight as grasshoppers. And so we were in their sight. Now, you know, we, this, is, this is something literal that's taking place in the history of God's people. Where there's a group of people that are fearful to move forward with what God's told them. Yet there's a small group that has the courage and the power to trust God. To move forward with what God has called them to do. Now I don't mean to take this out of context. But I will say this. Each and every one of us in this room. Have had some type of aspirations in our life. Sometimes for various reasons. Those aspirations. Ended up falling to the wayside. Sometimes right. Because to be honest with you. When I look backwards now. I wish I would have went to be a doctor. I know now I could have done it. You see. But, but that's beside the point. I know still that I'm in God's will. Thank God that. Look, I was a high school dropout bound up on drugs and alcohol and in such a mess. Yet through it, God allowed me to get a GED and then ultimately to get a master's degree. So it's not like, thank God, it doesn't always happen that way. But my point is this, is that that in and of itself, I thought that that was a beautiful thing and it was an awesome testimony, right? I would tell people, man, this is what God did in my life. But guess what? God doesn't always do that exactly that way in everybody's life. But yet, nevertheless, there are things in the physical that God oftentimes or that we have desires to accomplish in our lives. Right. Yeah. And, but yet sometimes we're stricken with fear to move forward with them. Sometimes it's to start a business. Sometimes it's to do. And I'm just kind of talking to you on a practical level right now. Right. Sometimes it's to start a business. Sometimes it's to, to do this, to move, you know, whatever the case. But we feel it in our bones and it's something that we want to do. But yet we're stricken with a little bit of fear. And, and, and we don't really want to move forward with it, right? Mm -hmm. and, and But what I want you to know is this, is that if we would trust the Lord in it, if we knew it was God's will, he would go before us and he would give us the courage that we need in order to accomplish what it is as long as it's his will. Mm -hmm. But one of the things that I can tell you, and I said it last week, and I think Troy brought it up on Wednesday night, is that no matter what you accomplish in the physical world, meaning whatever your job is, whatever you, uh, uh, you know, uh, aspire to be your purpose for God is to live for him and to take back that property that he's calling his people to take back which to, it means to live for him and to be separated out for the Lord and if our hearts are right towards that to live for God and we can trust him then he will bless the amen. things amen. that it is that we move yeah. forward right. with amen? amen and so I just wanted to say that because maybe I felt that this morning when I was reading that maybe there was somebody here in the physical sense that God has put something in their heart and, and, and there's a desire in their heart to move forward with it. And if it's God's will, don't allow the enemy to cripple you with fear, but instead trust the Lord. But always remember that the end goal is not for you to be a pharmacist or a doctor or a, a nurse practitioner or an electrician. No, the end result is for you to be what it is that he's given you the strength to do. But while you're there to be a witness for him. And to live for him in front of the world. Amen. All right. And uh, so it goes on to say that 
For they are stronger than we, and they brought up an evil report of the land which they had searched unto the children of Israel, saying, The land through which we have gone to search it is a land that eats up the inhabitants thereof, and all the people that we saw in it are men of a great stature. And there we saw the giants, the sons of Anak, which come of the giants, and we were in our own sight as grasshoppers, and so we were in their sight." You know, recently I preached, I said, I told y'all this morning, I preached this message, but it was from a different angle. And I've already said it before this morning, but God was giving them the land. He promised that he was going to go before them and give them the land. And what they were supposed to do was trust him in that, that he would deliver on his promises, right? It was theirs for the taking. They even brought back the evidence of the cluster of grapes to show. And to me, when I looked at that little cluster of grapes, I started thinking, because I was looking at this in another, in another way, I started looking at that cluster of grapes as a picture of victory. Yeah, you know, I call it a little cluster of grapes, but really it wasn't that little. But whenever we get a little bit further into the message, and I think we're going to have time to do it, there's a whole big harvest of grapes ahead oh, that, that this is just a type of. You see what I'm saying? A cl that cluster of grapes is, is symbolic of a victory that God wanted to be for his people. And as they would go in and to take a piece of the land that God had promised them. But there's coming a day when Jesus is going to fulfill it. And that's why the title of this morning's message is Faithful Until He Delivers in the end, right? So they were to bring a portion back of the what God was promising. And once again, I believe that this is a type of that victory that Jesus will bring us in the end. God wanted his people then and he wants believers today to, to trust him for the victory, to bring forth and, and you know the to believe in the promises that he has for the future. And he wants us to be willing to go into this world armed with the Holy Spirit of God, trusting in the victory that Jesus has already won. Right. And bring back some of those trophy grapes that we as we carry his light into the midst of a darkened world, we bring his light into into darkness. Does that make sense? Just as the sun shines and dispels darkness in the sky, night sky, uh, you know, brings the day time, the light of Jesus in your life dispels darkness when you bring it wherever it is that you're going. You know, the sad thing is that only jo uh, Caleb and Joshua and Moses believe God. They, they're the only ones that really believed that it was possible. The others, they didn't believe. And it would be many years later, to be, to be honest with you, I want you to think about that. You know, Joshua, after Moses dies, is the leader that actually brings the children of Israel into the promises that God had given. But it was many years later. It didn't happen all at once. There was a time frame between the promises and the actual fulfillment of it. But he was faithful to God until the end. He remained faithful to the Lord. Now I want to go to Hebrews chapter 3. This is another long passage of scripture uh, that we're going to read starting in verse 1. And I want you to know that this passage of scripture is in some places directly referring back to what we just read. So that's why I'm using it. And I can tell you that there's some spots in here that are a little bit cumbersome to deal with. But we're going we're gonna to try to deal with them, okay? So it says right here, Wherefore, holy brethren, partakers of the heavenly calling. Now, first off, I just want to stop right there and I want to make a point. People have argued about this book of Hebrews for quite some time. Very, whether or not these were really Christians, whether or not they just kind of believed intellectually in their mind and they weren't really with their heart believing in God. The scenario behind this, and I've explained this to the church before, is that these particular believers were facing persecution. So just as Israel saw the giants and feared, these Christians that were previously Jewish, following after Jewish religion, have now given their hearts to Jesus, and they're being persecuted because of their decision to live for the Lord, and now they're being stricken with fear in their hearts, and there's a desire for them. They're having a desire and a temptation to move back towards Jewish religion, to move back towards temple sacrifice. The temple was still erected at this time and to move away from the profession that they made about Jesus. So that's the that's the context. So that's why the writer uses the story that we just read to try to speak to them to say, hey. They, too, were stricken, and look, there were some that, that had a fear of unbelief, but you can't turn back. You, you've made a profession about the Lord. Now, the thing of it is, is that for you and I, 
we're never going to really face what these guys face. Why? Number one, we're not Jewish. Number two, the temple's destroyed. You don't have an option. You can't go offer up a, a lamb on the altar. But just as the children of Israel, and I know we've spoken about this many times, were tempted to go back to Egypt, the former way of life, mm -hmm. willing to choose slavery rather than the freedom that God offered, you and I, at times, when the tough, tough times get tough, can be are tempted many times to go back to what we knew before. That's right. How many people have just fallen away from church and gone back into the life that they were in before, went back to their drinking and their nightclubs and went back to their illicit relationships and all of those things to feed their flesh because they just did not really know how to hold on to the Lord. The enemy will always try to tempt people to try to draw them back. And so, but this scripture says, wherefore, holy brethren, he's calling them brothers in the Lord, holy because they're sanctified because they put faith in Christ. Partakers of the heavenly calling. They've partaken of the gospel because through faith now the Holy Spirit lives in them. Consider the apostle and high priest of our profession, Christ Jesus, who was faithful to him who appointed him. Jesus was faithful. Jesus was obedient. Jesus finished the race. Amen. Jesus climbed the hill with the cross. And Jesus accomplished the will of the Father. Amen. As also Moses was faithful in all his house. Jesus was faithful. Moses was faithful. But, you know, the writer's also going to say, but listen, Jesus was greater than Moses Amen. because he's talking to Jewish people. And he's saying, you want to go back to the old house? You want to go back to the old ways? No, Jesus fulfilled all of that. Amen. He says, uh, for this man was counted worthy of more glory than Moses, inasmuch as he who built the house has more honor than the house. So God gave Moses directions on how to build the tabernacle, right? But, but Jesus is building the house in the sense of the big plan of God. Jesus is the architect because he's the word that's spoken into existence. The word became flesh, dwelt upon the earth, died on the cross, fulfilled the will of the Father as the sacrifice, and allowed the Holy Spirit to descend on the day of Pentecost and for the church, amen, to be conceived so that the plan of God would move forward. And so as an architect or the builder of the house, we're not just talking about the little tabernacle. We're talking about the fact that God used Jesus to build the whole plan of God. Amen. And he goes on to say, for every house is built by some man, but he that built all things is God. God used Jesus as the pre-incarnate word. What does incarnate mean? Whenever Jesus became flesh. So before that, the word spoke the worlds into existence. I got all kind of scripture I could bring you to. I've done it before. Colossians, Hebrews, you know, John. That show that Jesus was the creator of this earth through the word that was spoken. Amen. God used him as the architect to bring forth his plan for humanity. And Moses was ver verily was faithful in his house as a servant. So Moses was a servant in the house of God operating in the tabernacle in the Old Testament. For a testimony of those things which were to be spoken after. But Christ was a son over his own house. Christ was the son over the house, meaning he was the master of the house. And listen, look at this. Whose house are we? And he goes on to say, if we hold fast the confidence and the, and the rejoicing of the hope firm unto the end. We are the house. Well, what, what is he talking about? Can you real quick go to Ephesians chapter 2, verse 19? We're the house. Amen. Jesus is the builder of the house. Jesus is the builder of the plan. It says in Ephesians 2, 19, look at this. Now, therefore, you are no more strangers and foreigners. Who, well, he, well, who's Paul talking to? He's talking to the church of Ephesus. If you know anything about Ephesus real quick, Ephesus is a place known as Asia Minor. There was an isthmus of land, a land mass here. And so Ephesus would have been, I think, somewhere right around here. Greece is over here. Rome is over here. This is the west. That's the east. This is Israel, Asia Minor, Ephesus. What is that? Why did I even draw that? Because they are Jews. They're Gentiles. They don't know God until they got saved because Paul preached the gospel. And so now he's speaking to them saying, you're no more strangers and foreigners because see, the only people that weren't strangers and foreigners before were these people. What is he talking about? They're, we're the only people that knew of God. The Jewish people were the only ones that knew God because God called Abraham and created a nation out of him. 
You used to be strangers and foreigners because you were from over there and you worshipped Diana. Some rock that fell supposedly from the planet Jupiter that had a bunch of, well, it just did what it did, PG-13, had a bunch of boobies on it. And th that's what it looked like, this rock that fell. And that's what they did, they worshipped her. Because she was full of life and full of, you know, like, like when a woman would breastfeed, she had nourishment and she could deliver whatever it was that they needed. That's what it had. That's what this rock had on it. And that, they, that's why they worshiped Diana. So they were, they were strangers and foreigners, but fellow citizens with the saints and of the household of God. That's who you were, but now this is who you are. You're fellow citizens of the household of God. And so in the next verse right here, it says, And are built upon the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Jesus Christ himself, being the chief cornerstone. So the apostles and the prophets went forward and Jesus was the cornerstone of this of the foundation of this building and we're talking about the building of God and the next the next verse in whom all the building fitly framed together grows into a holy temple in the Lord next verse in whom you also are built together for a habitation of God through the Spirit. What did I say all that for? Because the building that we're talking about that Jesus ultimately built resulted in the fact that now the presence of God that used to dwell in a tent in the Old Testament in the Holy of Holies now dwells in you. Right. You've become the building of God. Moses was, was awesome as a servant in the house of God, but Jesus is the master over the house. Amen? And that the plan of God is that the presence of God would live in the inside of God's people. Amen? But we got to hold fast to the end. Hold fast the confidence and the rejoicing of the hope firm unto the end. Wherefore, as the Holy Ghost says, today, if you will hear his voice, harden not your hearts as in the provocation. That's another word for the provoking. God says, when you hear the gospel, don't harden your hearts as they did in the day of the provoking, because they provoked me. Because I told them I was going to give them the land, and they didn't believe that I could give them the land. They didn't believe I could deliver all my promises. In the day of temptation or testing, it could be said, in the wilderness, when your fathers tested me, it says tempted, but the idea is tested. Your fathers tested me. They proved me. They put me to the test. They wanted to see what was in me because they didn't believe me. And saw my works 40 years. God, listen, God delivered e uh, the, the children of Israel out of Egypt with a mighty hand. He caused a death plague. He caused multiple plagues to happen. He split the Red Sea. He delivered them. Yet while they're wandering around in the Canaan, in the wilderness before they entered Canaan, they didn't believe that God could bring them through. And even still, for 40 years, he still showed himself. Mm -hmm. he, he let manna fall from heaven each and every day. Wow. He gave them water to drink from a rock. And he changed bitter waters into sweet waters. And he constantly showed up. But yet they did not believe that he could deliver. He said for 40 years they saw it. Wherefore I was grieved with that generation. And said they do always err in their heart. Who erred? Everybody but Caleb and Moses and Joshua. And they have not known my way. So I swear in my wrath they shall not enter into my rest. Rest. Big part of what I want to talk to you about this morning has to do with rest. Faithful until he delivers in the end. See, when he was talking about rest right there, he meant Canaan, this property right here that he was promising them. But he, in this next passage of scripture that we read, he's going to talk about rest multiple times. And if you don't keep up with him, you kind of get lost. So right there he's talking about Canaan. He goes on to say, take heed, brethren, lest there be in any of you, you Hebrew Christians that used to be Jews, that used to worship in the te temple and, and offer up sacrifices, now you've professed Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. And because you're persecuted, now you're questioning your faith and you're wavering in your faith and you're planning on possibly going back to the old way. Don't let an unbelieving heart be in you, is what he's telling me. In departing from the living God, but instead exhort one another daily while it is called today, lest any of you be hardened through the deceitfulness of sin. For we are made partakers of Christ if we hold the beginning of our confidence steadfast unto the end. You can't, it's not how you start the race, it's how you finish the race. Are you going to hold on to the Lord no matter what it is that you're going through? You got to trust in the Lord, amen, and receive strength from God no matter how bad you're persecuted. I'm sorry. 
We might not like the things that happen to us sometimes, but I guarantee you Jesus didn't personally like getting beat with a whip. He didn't like getting ridiculed. Nobody likes being treated like that. While it is said today, if you will hear his voice, harden not your hearts as in the provocation or in the provoking. For some, when they had heard, did, did provoke. Howbeit, not all that came out of Egypt by Moses. In other words, not all the people that came out of Egypt with Moses didn't believe God. Some of them believed God, but then some of them didn't believe God. And they provoked God. But with whom was he grieved 40 years? Who was it that he was grieved with? Was it not with them that had sinned? Whose carcasses fell in the wilderness? See, whenever they, when Joshua and Caleb went back with the good report, God said, that's fine. Y'all don't want y'all don't want the land I'm promising y'all. All y'all gonna die in the wilderness. Every last one of you. Ain't not one of you gonna make it. But guess what? I'm gonna give it to your children. You, you say that you say that these giants would make bread out of your children. Guess what? I'm gonna give it to your children. But you're not gonna make it. You're gonna die. And 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 because they could not believe God in the midst of what He was promising them. And those are the ones that who fell in, whose carcasses fell in the wilderness. And to whom swear He that they should not enter into His rest? But to them that believed not. So we see that they could not enter in because of unbelief. Let us therefore fear lest a promise being left us of entering into his rest. Any of you should not. Any of you should seem to come short of it. For unto us was the gospel preached as well as unto them. But the word preached did not profit them. Not being mixed with faith in them that heard it. For we which have believed do enter into rest. So check this out. So God was talking about a rest for Israel back then. But he's saying, hey, because this is New Testament right here. This, the gospel was preached to them. Trust God. He's going to come through for you. And the gospel is being preached to us. So there was a rest that was promised to them back then. But there's a rest promised to you today. Okay. And the, the author is saying, and it was a, a rest that was promised to them. You're going to find a rest in the Lord, he's going to get, he gets into that a little bit more, but you got to trust God. You can't have an unbelieving heart. You got to trust the Lord. So he promises, he's giving promises of rest. All right. So in this next passage, let's keep going. He says, as he said, as I have sworn in my wrath, if they shall enter into my rest, I put in brackets right there, shall not, because that's really the translation. They shall not enter into my rest is what God's saying. Although the works were finished from the foundation of the world, for he spoke in a certain place of the seventh day on this wise, God did rest the seventh day from all his works. So what is he saying right there? He's talking about rest, right? Is he talking about Canaan rest? No, he's talking about the rest after creation, right? So God's talking about the Sabbath. He's talking about the Sabbath rest. He said, and so God gave us a precedence of rest. He said, do you think God was tired? No, God doesn't get tired. He set a precedence to let us know my people are going to need rest. All right, we're getting somewhere with this. He was talking about the Sabbath. And in this place again, if they shall, and I'll put it in there, not enter into my rest. Now he's talking about Canaan again. He's talking about the children of Israel. He, 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 he instituted rest on the Sabbath, okay, after he created then he promised the children of Israel years later that there would be a rest in the land of Canaan. All right. Seeing, therefore, it remains that some must enter therein and they to whom it was first preached entered not in because of unbelief. Again, he limiteth. That word means marks. He marks a certain day in David. So listen to me. I know that this is a little bit confusing, but we have creation. And with creation, we have a Sabbath rest. We have the Exodus, 1450 B.C. And with that, we have a Canaan rest. And then this is actually, if I'm not mistaken, talking about Psalm 95. And so this is 1000 B.C. because David wrote it. We're talking about another rest. The point is, is that the fulfillment of Sabbath was in Jesus. But right here, the Canaan rest has already passed. But David says there's another rest to come. Amen. All right. And so he said, and when he's talking about his rest in Jesus, he says, uh, he, and he marked a certain day saying in David today, after so long a time, as it is said today, if you will hear his voice, harden not your hearts. And I've told you this before. This word should not have been Jesus right there. Okay. It's supposed to be Joshua. 
That's how the king, why? Because Joshua and Jesus is the same name. Joshua is the Hebrew name. Jesus is the Greek name. You with me? The context is not Jesus. We're still talking about the Old Testament wilderness experience entering into the promised land. If you have a new translation with you, all you got to do is look at it. It's not going to say Jesus. It's going to say Joshua. All right? The King James translators, they, they didn't translate it necessarily wrong, but it certainly causes confusion because they're putting the Greek name there instead of the Hebrew name. All right? So it says right here, if Joshua had given them rest, then would he not afterward have spoken of another day? Therefore, there remains, therefore, a rest to the people of God. So the point being is, is that if Joshua in 1450 B.C. would have given them the rest that God was promising, then David would have never talked about another rest later on. Does that make sense? There remains a rest for the people of God. Why, why are you going on and on about all this? You're putting me to sleep with all this reading. Why? Because you need rest. You need to find rest for your weary soul. I mean, am I telling you the truth or am I lying to you? You got to stop every now and then and wake people up. Do you, am I the only one that needs some rest around here? No. Do you ever find things chaotic in your life? Yes. Do you ever find things troublesome in your life? Yes. I know you do. And you need rest for your weary soul. Rest in Jesus yes. is what he's talking about. Amen. For he that has entered into his rest, he also has ceased from his own works as God did from his. Let us labor, therefore, to enter into that rest, lest any man fall after the same example of those in the Old Testament of unbelief. For the word of God is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword. Piercing even to the dividing asunder of soul and spirit and of the joints and marrow and as a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. What does that have anything to do with this passage of scripture, preacher? Well, I'm going to tell you what it has to do with. Because if you will allow the word of God to speak to you, it will reach deep down inside of your heart. It will start to reveal to you the things that are in your heart. Amen. And in this particular context, let's use it. Let's use it as a modern day example. The people that we're writing to in Hebrews are Jewish Christians that now are talking about going back to Old Testament sacrifice. They probably think they're making a spiritual decision. They have probably in their mind convinced themselves that it's okay for them to go back because this was God's original plan for their life. This is what they were born in. You understand what I'm saying? But the word of God will discern. Amen. The word of God will discern soul versus spirit. Amen. It will discern what you, what you want in your heart versus what God wants in your heart if you'll let it speak to you. And a modern day example would be, and I'm just using this as an example, and it might apply to some and it may not apply to others. Sometimes people don't like the church that they're going to for whatever reason. I mean, I've been to churches before that I didn't really like. And we can, in our own minds, justify us going to another church. And I'm not here to tell you that God will never tell anybody in this place to go to another church. But you need to know for sure that it's God telling you to go to the other church and not your own soul or your own desire telling you to go to another church. Because you can you can contemplate things in your own mind and convince yourself, that, well, look, that's a good church over there. Look, you know, they want to do the right thing. They're reaching out to people. But guess what? And I'm not saying that this is the only church where anybody's preaching the truth. That's not the point I'm trying to make. But that church over there may not be as concerned about preaching the truth of the, of the word, which what you need to give you guidance in this journey called life. Amen. And you could make a soulish decision to leave. And it's actually not the plan of God. Amen. And it doesn't have to be this church. It can be any church. Yeah. No matter what church you're going to, if God has planted you there, you're supposed to stay there. And the only time you should leave is if God tells you to leave. That's right. Amen. 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 And so... That was the point about that, the, the word of God and what it does and how it discerns and it judges between the soul and the spirit. Neither is there any creature that is not manifest in the sight. In other words, God sees everything. He knows everything. There's nothing hidden in the closet from him. But all things are naked and open unto the eyes of him with whom we have to do. Seeing then that we have a great high priest that is passed into the heavens, Jesus, the son of God, let us hold fast our profession. Now he's saying a lot right there. He's saying Jesus was faithful. Jesus accomplished the will of the Father. Jesus resurrected from the dead. Jesus ascended to the Father. 
Jesus entered into the heavenly holy of holies. And because of all of that, you can hold fast to your profession or your confession about God. Don't turn your back on the Lord. Don't go back to where you were before. Stay faithful until the end when he delivers. For we have not a high priest which cannot be touched with the feeling of our infirmities. Jesus felt your pain. Jesus experienced the pain of humanity. He might not have experienced exactly what you experienced. Listen, I experienced some pain. I mean, my sister was bound on drugs. She had a, she just, it just is what it is. And ultimately, because of that and the depression that it caused in her life, she took her life. That was one of the most painful experiences that I've ever felt. I mean, I can't even be, I'm not going to sit here and take the time to explain to you how I felt from that. How, even in my own selfish mindset, I was worried about what people were going to think about me. Oh, and they still do that, but thank God he freed me from all that. Mm -hmm. I don't have to worry about it. I mean, I could care less what you think. Mm -hmm. You don't even know, you know what I'm saying? You don't know what you're even talking about. But I knew that that stigma was there. But, but, the point that, but the point that I'm trying to make is, is that Jesus experienced the pain of humanity. I know I don't hear, read that his sister killed herself. But nevertheless, he felt the pain of death. He felt the pain of what sin causes people. Because when Lazarus died, the Bible says he wept because he saw the people groaning and moaning and the pain that they experienced when their loved one died. Jesus experienced that. Jesus, you, you feel pain. Jesus knows what it means to be alone. Sometimes people feel alone. Jesus knows what it means to be alone. My, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? He was forsaken from the Father, not because of his sin, but because of my sin. It caused the Father to turn away from him. He's experienced the loneliness and the separation of, 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 the, of love. And, you, know, from, you know, you get what I'm saying, the, the feeling of separation. So he's a high priest that has entered in and we can know and feel confident, amen, that we can access. And that's what it says right there. Let us therefore come boldly into the throne of grace that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in this time of need. So again, two common themes, recurrent thoughts in both of these passages of scripture really built upon the fact that God's given promises. God has a plan. God's built a house. God's built a plan. And he just wants his people at that point in time in history to trust him and to move forward with what it is that he's asking them to do. Mm -hmm. And we see, again, the recurrent theme that some believe and some don't believe. And people are struggling with all of these things. And the truth be told that each and every one of us in this room have struggled to some extent. Yeah. And the devil even put in your head whether God's real or not. Come on. He still tries to yeah. put stupid thoughts like that in the preacher's head. I'm like... Where'd that come from? I know God's real. I've seen what God's done in my life. But that lying devil ain't going to quit. He's going to keep on trying. And so we see once again how they were tempted Israel to go back to Egypt. And, the, and these people that we're talking about right here were tempted to go back to temple sacrifice. Even after they had professed or confessed that they were saved, that they had given their life to Jesus. Also in common, we have Joshua, Caleb, and Moses were faithful to trust God in the Hebrews passage. Jesus was faithful to be obedient to the Father's will and architect the finished plan so that you and I could have spiritual rest in Christ today and a fulfilled rest in Him to come tomorrow. I wanted to point that out. Because even, listen, there's a rest in Jesus today, but it's not the final rest. There's another rest ahead on the horizon, and I'm going to talk to you a little bit about that. And in the next 10 minutes, I'm going to finish all three points. There's a final rest stop up ahead. Let's look, let's look again at what well, let me we don't even have to go there. I'm just going to tell you. In Hebrews 4, 4 through 9, he talked about the seventh day, creation, the Sabbath rest. Then he said, they're not going to enter into my rest. And he was talking about the Canaan rest. And then he says that he marks off or delineates another day where there would be a future rest. And that rest comes through Jesus and his finished work on the cross. There remains a rest for the people of God. God wants you and I to know that there's a rest today. Even amidst all the chaos, all the things that you're going to face, all the struggles that you're going to face, you need to understand that there's a rest that waits for you today. Yeah. Now, does that mean that you're never going to experience anything negative on this earth? No, this earth is fallen. It's full of sin. And everything about it is against you, against your Jesus, against the gospel. There remains a rest, though. 
I remember one time I had, well, I had two different conversations with two different preachers. I keep having conversations with one of them because he comes into the clinic. And both times, and I'm not trying to pick on them, but both times they just look so weary. And their former rest, oh man, we need our rest. We need, we need our rest. And their idea of rest, one of them was a nap, and the other one is every time he comes in, it's a vacation. Now you know, Brother Matt likes vacation every now and then. I'll take two a year sometimes. This old boy, every time he comes in, he's going, oh brother, we're about to go on a vacation, and we're just so tired. That is not the rest that the Lord's talking about. Sometimes you go on vacation, you're more tired when you get back than when you left. I'm all about a nap every now and then, but that's not going to fix the issue. Amen. The rest that the Lord's talking about is not just that you don't do nothing on a sa on Sunday, that you can't cut your grass. No. What, he, what he's talking about is a rest that's found in Jesus. Wow. Matthew chapter 11. Amen. Matthew chapter 11, verses 28 through 30. Jesus says, Come unto me, all you that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn of me, for I am meek and lowly in heart. You shall find rest unto your souls, for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Rest from works. See, the yoke talks about work. The yoke is, a, is an instrument that hooked two beasts of burden together that worked to plow a field. The yoke speaks of work. Jesus says, I've done the work. You come take your yoke. Yoke yourself to me. I'm going to give you rest because you're now going to operate in my work. And now the rest for spiritual righteousness. This is not about spiritual righteousness. You know what I'm going to tell you? Because we're going to go to the next, the next passage of scripture. And it started in verse 12. It started in chapter 12. Go, go to Matthew 12, verse 1. That's the name. At that time, Jesus went on the Sabbath day through the corn. It's really a word for talk about a wheat field. And his disciples were hungry and began to pluck the ears of wheat, is what it really means, and to eat. So we got a problem because according to the law on the Sabbath, you're not allowed to pluck wheat and do that because it's like you're doing harvest. It's like you're doing work. Jesus, at that time, when he talked about my burden is easy, take my yoke upon you for my burden is easy. I've done the work. And we're talking about the work of righteousness. Why? Because they were trying to keep the law. They were trying to keep the Sabbath in order to earn their own righteousness. You can't come to this church enough times. You can't get involved in enough ministry. You can't read your Bible enough. You can't do anything spiritual enough to try to earn the righteousness of God. Jesus did the work of righteousness and he gave it to you as a gift. You need to learn how to recognize that and rest in that and at the same time when you do that the grace of God will strengthen you and make you happy enough to say you know what Lord thank you for rest thank you for moving on my behalf now I want to learn a little bit more about your word yeah. I want to apply myself to learn your word amen I want to go to the house of God and be with the people of God because your word says to not forsake the gathering of the brethren because we're supposed to be a community like a family of people that live for God alright and so, anyway, he goes on to say, then come the Pharisees, the religious folk. Remember that. You know, they don't want you trusting in Christ. Even today, you start preaching the message of the cross to preachers out there, they don't want you. Oh, no, you can't tell the people there's freedom like that. You got to keep them controlled. You got to tell them they got to read this much and go to church this much. And they need to be involved in all these ministries. Look, we may have an opening pretty soon, you know. In nursery or something like that, if nobody steps up to take the place, guess what? I don't know. Maybe I got to go do it or something. And then y'all can, one of y'all can preach. I don't know what to tell you, but if we got an opening, somebody's got to feel it. Feel it. Amen. I can't do it all, right? Amen. I'm not trying to make you feel weird. I'm just trying to tell you something's got to happen. And it can't be, I mean, if it's me, then I'm not going to be preaching. I mean, if one of y'all want to take, the, I mean, I know that we can, I mean, but Aaron's not here all the time. Yeah, we got a couple other preachers. I don't know why I said all that. But anyway, because there is work to be done in love. <laughs> Behold, your disciples do that which is unlawful to do on the Sabbath. That's what he's talking about. It's not lawful. Go, go to the next verse. But he said unto them, Have you not read what David did when he was hungry? And they that were with him. Next verse. How he entered into the house of God and he ate the showbread which was not lawful for him to eat. Neither for them which were with him, but only for the priests. Next verse. Jesus goes on to say this. We're not going to break that down. But basically, Jesus goes on to say this. I am the Lord of the Sabbath. What I need you to know is that Jesus fulfilled 
the work of God. He fulfilled the Sabbath. Listen to me. I'm talking about rest. That was part A. Rest from works. Because I'm talking about there's a final rest stop up ahead. And part B of point number one, there's a final, there's a rest stop up ahead. I have to tell you that, that this isn't the final rest. That there's a destination up ahead. And the kid in the back of the car says, are we there yet? <laughs> no, but we're getting real close. Yes. <laughs> hey, close to what? We're getting closer every day we wake up to the rapture of the church. First John chapter three, verses one through three. I may not be able to finish this message. <laughs> this may have to be a part two. I tried, but I'm not going to keep, keep you here till 12, till 1230. Oh, <laughs> and y'all going to be mad because y'all missed the same. All right, fine, then I'll preach. Behold what manner of love the Father has bestowed on us. You know, I've told y'all before that word manner. I just love this. <laughs> the idea behind this word in the Greek is that it comes from another tribe or another place. Essentially, what John is saying in this letter is this love that God put on us, it comes from somewhere else. You don't know nothing about this kind of love. This doesn't look anything like the kind of love that human beings know about. Because, and what does he mean? Because truthfully, if we're honest with one another, each and every one of us in here know that even when we felt the deepest love that we've ever felt for another human being before in our life, in some way, shape, or form, has often been motivated with selfishness to some level. Even, even the purest of, of things that we've done many times. I'm not trying to say every single time, but you get the point that I'm trying to make. There's some level of, that's not what God's love looks like. God's love is completely selfless. God's love is completely selfless. Amen. And that's the manner of love that God has placed upon us. Uh, that he bestowed upon us that we should be called the sons of God. Therefore, the world knows us not because it knew him not. When you operate like the Lord, by his grace, the world doesn't know what that looks like because you're completely different than them. Right? Amen. Next verse. Beloved, now are we the sons of God, and it does not yet appear what we shall be, but we know that when we shall, he shall appear, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. The final destination of rest is not just that we trust in Christ today to receive grace for, and that we're clothed with his righteousness. Amen. But the final destination of rest is when we see the Lord, when the rapture takes place and this whole thing that it's been for is completed and fulfilled. Because when we see him, we will receive a glorified body like he is. They ain't no more worried about works of righteousness now. Ain't no more worried about none of that stuff because now sin is eradicated from the human body and now we're able to worship the Lord the way God always intended it to be because sin will have finally been dealt with yeah. in the life of God's people. Amen? Amen? Love from another world, but one day that love's going to bring us to His world. Yeah. Amen? Amen. And so Paul said this in 1 Corinthians 15 verses 50 through 53. He says, Now I say this, brethren, that flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God. I don't care how holy you think you are, how pure you think your little heart is, <laughs> your flesh is not going to inherit the kingdom of God because it, it has sin in it. You still have a sin nature in you. He says, behold, I show you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed. In other words, we're not all going to die, but every last one of us in the end for this final rest will be changed. If you did fall asleep or die, that's really what it's talking about, and you're in the grave, the Bible says with the voice of the trumpet, with the voice of the archangel, the trumpet of God, the dead in Christ shall rise first. The graves are going to pop open. Then we who are alive and remain will go to meet him in the Lord, in the air, and there shall we be with the Lord forevermore. In the clouds is what it says. And we will go to meet the Lord in the clouds, and there we shall be with the Lord forevermore. When that happens, then the corruptible, it goes on to say this, that's what it means. We're all going to be changed. In the moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trump, for the trumpet will sound, the dead shall be raised incorruptible, and we shall be changed. For this corruptible must put on incorruption, and this mortal must put on immortality. When we receive, see him, we will receive our glorified body. This journey on this earth will have ended. The final rest will be complete. There will be no more struggle. Hallelujah. There will be no more pain. Revelation chapter 21 verses 4 through 5. The final rest stop 
and destination will have been, been completed. This is what John says in Revelation. This is the end. This is, this is when it's all said and done and sin has been dealt with. The devil's been dealt with. God shall wipe away all tears from their eyes. There shall be no more death, neither sorrow nor crying, neither shall there be any more pain, for the former things are passed away. And he that sat upon the throne said, Behold, I make all things new. And he said unto me, Write, for these words are true and faithful. Hallelujah. Listen, faithful until, until he delivers in the end. Amen. There's been some faithful people in the house of God, but Jesus's words are faithful and true. And I'm here to tell you that there's going to be a final destination, a final rest stop. Second point that I wanted to make, that was just my first point of the message, but we're gonna, it's not going to be too much longer. I call point number two, the lion's share. Now, the lion's share is really an idiom in English. And what it means is the major portion. And so really and truly, it's not fair for me to call point number two the lion's share because this is just going to be a major portion I'm about to talk about. is all Jesus's. It be, every, all, every last inch of it belongs to him. So when he gets the lion's share, it's not going to be a major portion. It'll be all of it. The whole thing. This whole globe that we call earth, Amen. it belongs to him. Yeah. And there's coming a day... When he's going to take it back. He's going to reap it for himself. Uh, if, you, if you go back and you remember when Joshua and Caleb were doing that exploration. They cut off that cluster of grapes. And I said that this was like a trophy. I felt like a, a, a piece or a type of the future whenever God was going to. Because he wanted them to take that little piece of land. And there's coming a day back that's filled with the imagery of grapes, wine press. Great juice flying all over the place where God takes back this whole earth because it belongs to him. And in point number B, whenever we talked about the rapture of the church, and that's just the beginning. That's just the beginning of whenever God is going to make all things new. Everything that we've ever known about the earth that we've lived on, everything that we've ever known about this life is going to begin at that moment to change forever. It's never going to look the same. You can't even wrap your minds around it. Children are going to be able to play near a cobra's hole. Lions are going to eat straw like an ox. Well, don't tell me I'm crazy. I mean, if an ox can have all that muscle mass by eating grass, so can a lion. My, my, my point is, is that God's going to do something and it's going to be his spirit during the millennial reign of Christ. It's going to be ruling in the atmosphere and everything's going to be different. It's going to be a hallelujah, a kingdom of peace. Yes. Amen. Thank you, Jesus. Yes. You know, we've been talking about the Feast of Trumpets on Wednesday nights because we've been talking about the feast, how the first four show us historically what Jesus already did and that the next three look prophetically towards what he will do and that the Feast of Trumpets, we believe, is representative of the rapture of the church and the fact that Jesus resurrected on the Feast of First Fruits. You remember that? And on Wednesday, you remember how I just love that? I mean, the Lord gave that to me while I was talking. How on the Feast of First Fruits, what they did was the uh, the, uh, the priest would go into the field and he'd grab him a, a handful of the, uh, the, the wheat and he'd cut it with a sickle and he'd pick it up and he'd wave it. And that was the Feast of First Fruits. Well, Jesus resurrected on the Feast of First Fruits. And while I was preaching, all of a sudden I got this imagery in my head of this big old field of, of, of grain, golden grain, and it's waving. And, and it's waving in the wind. And there's this one little spot that's missing out of the field because Jesus already resurrected. Amen. It's not that he's missing from our life. He lives in our heart. But I'm just trying to give you an imagery. And there's this little piece that's missing in this field. And this whole field is over here waving. Like, come back and get us, Lord. Because it's waiting for the rapture. All creation groans, the Bible says in the book of Romans. Why? Because everything on this earth is messed up because of sin. And everything is groaning and waiting for the redemption of the sons of men. What is that talking about? It's talking about the final countdown, the day when the Lord takes us back to be with him and the day that we receive that glorified body. And when that happens, the earth even knows you. Yeah. Listen, we might be not that we're dumb, but we might be in the church. I'm just saying the church in general, not smart enough sometimes to wrap our minds around it and forget that God's coming back to get us. But even the creation knows it. 
All creation groans and it waits for the day when you will be glorified because when you're glorified, the earth knows, hey, we're next. We're next. And everything that God meant about this earth is going to be changed. God, God, I make all things new. That's right. See, and the rapture just begins it. But there's going to be a process of time for those that are unbelievers. Listen to me. It's not going to be good for the people that you know that reject the gospel. It's not going to be good for people that never got to hear the gospel if we didn't do what it was that we were supposed to do. God's going to come back. Jesus is coming back and he's going to take back this earth because it belongs to him. And that little cluster that belonged in the area of Canaan was just one little piece of property to show us that God's coming back. Genesis chapter 49 verse 1 Starting with that, I want you to see that even long before Israel, this is, Israel was already in Egypt when this happened. This is Jacob prophesying over his sons. I'm going forward because these people told me to. So if y'all got a problem with it, y'all can fuss it. There's about three people that said do it. So I'm going to do it. All right. Genesis 49.1. Jacob is giving a prophecy over his sons. He's about to die. He says, gather his sons around him. He's going to give a prophecy to them. All right. To talk about their future. We're going to, to, to verse uh, eight. Go to eight. This is what he starts saying about Judah. Now, y'all know who Judah is, right? <laughs> Judah is his son. Judah is Jacob's son. What? What? Time frame is Judah, somewhere around 2000 BC. That's about whenever Abraham was born. Jacob was Abraham's grandson. So I'm just saying about Judah was Jacob's son. From Judah came King David about 500 years later. Well, I mean, 1500 years later. And from David came who? Jesus. Jesus. All right. So when we hear Jacob talking in about, two, about 1800 BC or something like that, we got to understand that. The imagery of David is showing up, but ultimately fulfilled in Jesus. Way back when, whenever Jacob's talking. He says, Judah, you are, thou art he whom thy brethren shall praise. I was actually talking about this just the other day. Some of y'all might remember about, I was thinking about Joseph's coat of many colors and how he was a type of Christ as the suffering servant and how his dream said that his brothers were going to bow down to him. And as a type of Christ, his brothers were the tribes of the nations. And in this prophecy right here, Jacob said, Judah, your brothers are going to bow down to you. They're going to praise you. Your hand shall be in the neck of your enemies. God's going to give Jesus victory. He goes on to say, uh, your father's children shall bow down before you. There it is again. Judah is a lion's whelp. Connects, connects him to, to the lion of the tribe of Judah. From the prey, my son, thou art gone up. He stooped down. He crouched down as a lion. And that old lion who shall rouse him, the scepter, shall not depart from Judah. Now, you know, this is the kind of stuff that drives me crazy. George Lucas can get Anakin Skywalker from the Bible, but we can't even see it for God knows how many years. And Disney can get the lion. I'm telling you right now, Disney got the Lion King out of this right here. A lion with a scepter that's a king. I'm telling you right now, this is where that story came from. But we can't even see it. But here it is the whole time. Am I, am I promoting Disney? Am I promoting? What? No, that's not what I'm saying. I'm trying to make a point. They see it, but we don't even see it. He's a Lion King. Jesus, the lion of the tribe of Judah with a scepter in his hand, the king's staff in his hand, prophesying thousands of years later that he would show up. It shall not depart from Judah nor a lawgiver from between his feet until Shiloh comes. Unto him shall be the gathering of the, of the people be, binding his foal unto the vine. Now this is a picture. I'm going to be honest with you. I believe. I kept looking at this. This is a picture of his first coming and also when he comes back again. Why? He's tying a foal or a colt. Look what it says. It says, binding his foal to the vine or his ass's colt, which is another name for a donkey, unto the choice vine. So you get a picture of somebody, the Messiah, taking the donkey, they're taking the donkey and they're tying it to the vine. The vine of what? He washed his garments in wine and his clothes in the blood of grapes. That's talking about the second coming of Jesus. We got a picture of his first coming, the foal, the colt. We got a picture of his second coming, the grapes of the wine press of the wrath of God. 
Even before Jacob was dead and nearly 400 years before the people had even been released from Egyptian bondage, God was already prophesying about the end. From Judah would be a lion who would be a king, and there would be a day that all his brothers would bow down to him. That comes out of Zechariah 12. You don't really have to go there, but we preached it the other night. That there's coming a day when God said, I will pour out upon the inhabitants of Jerusalem and those in Judea. And he, and he says this, I'm going to pour grace on them. And they're going to look at me whom they pierced. And they will mourn for me as one who mourns for an only son. Israel crucified their savior. And now they're going to make a pact with the enemy. They're going to make a covenant with the antichrist. But there's going to be a day that they're going to realize they were deceived. And right in the moment of time when they feel like there's no hope, Jesus is going to come back for them. They're going to recognize who he is and they're going to bow their knee to him and they're going to give their hearts to him. But not only that, in some way his victory will be connected to a great harvest. Jesus is coming back for us as a savior, as a second coming for his people Israel, but he's also coming back as a judge. Isaiah chapter 63 verses 3 through 4. He says, I have trodden the winepress alone and of the people there was none with me for I will tread them in my anger and trample them in my fury and their blood shall be sprinkled upon my garments and I will stain all my raiment for the day of vengeance is in my heart and the year of my redeemed is come. The day of vengeance is in the heart of God. Listen, there's going to be a day whenever mercy is going to run out and the judgment of God is going to be poured upon the unbelieving earth. And it's not God's fault because all of this time he's trying, he's been desiring to communicate to mankind. He's been desiring for his people to communicate to mankind that he's coming back and that there's judgment. And listen to this. And the year of my redeemed has come. Amen. There's going to be vengeance on the unbelievers, but he's going to rescue his people Israel. God has a day prepared, hallelujah, when the redeemed are going to rejoice, but the unbeliever is going to mourn in sorrow. 700 years before his birth, this passage teaches what we just talked about, that God's judgment is going to be unleashed. Look at this, Joel chapter 3, verses 9 through 15. Proclaim ye this among the Gentiles. Prepare war. Wake up the mighty men. Let all the men of war draw near. Let them come up. Beat your plowshares into swords and your pruning hooks into spears. Let the weak say I am strong. Assemble yourselves and come all ye heathen. He said, hey, you Gentile nations that have been unbelieving. Really, this is talking about the dragon system too. You know, what I mean is, is that the Satan... And his whole system of lying to us and trying to deceive us all of these years, whether it's through financial markets, whether it's through false religion, whatever it was that he's held us subservient to him with, God's coming back to punish that system. God's coming back to destroy Mystery Babylon. God's coming back to destroy the harlot known as Babylon that the book of Revelation says. And he's saying, hey, all you men, gather yourselves together and come meet me. Take your plow, get all the weapons you can, beat your plowshares and your your pruning forks into weapons. Go ahead. Get all the weapons you can. Get all the people you can muster and meet me in a place called the Valley of Jehoshaphat. He says, assemble yourselves. Come all ye heathen and gather yourselves together round about. There cause your mighty ones to come down, O Lord. Let the heathen be wakened and come up to the Valley of Jehoshaphat. That's another name for Armageddon. This is talking about the Valley of Ar the Battle of Armageddon. Put ye in the sickle, for the harvest is ripe. Come get ye down, for the press is full. The fats overflow, for their wickedness is great. Multitudes, multitudes in the valley of decision. For the day of the Lord is near in the valley of decision. The sun and the moon shall be darkened, and the stars, stars shall withdraw their shining. The point that I'm trying to make to you is this. God just asked him to grab that little cluster of grapes, take that little piece of property. Because he knew, and he's asking you and I to grab that little cluster of grapes and take that little piece of property. What does that mean? Wherever he's placed you, wherever he's put you, he's asking you to speak for him. He's asking you to live for him, faithful to him until he delivers until the end because there's a people out there that are going to miss and this is what they have waiting for them and if you and I can't get more excited about that to know that God has allowed us to be part of what it is that he's doing and we can't get past our own daily so listen to me sometimes life hurts yes. but listen to me we got to move past that and see that there's a bigger picture Amen. most preachers aren't going to preach this way because I'm not hitting you where you're living I'm here to tell you though God's got a bigger plan for you Amen. 
Amen. And he's got a bigger purpose for you. And when it's all said and done, it's going to be worth it in the end. Because you're going to have a crown and you're going to get to give it back to him. Amen. Amen. Revelation 14, 14 through 20. Look at this. And I looked and behold a white cloud and upon the cloud one sat like unto the son of man, having on his head a golden crown and in his hand a sharp sickle. And another angel came out of the temple crying with a loud voice to him that sat on the cloud, thrust in your sickle and reap for the time has come for thee to reap for the harvest of the earth is ripe. And he that sat on the cloud thrust in his sickle on the earth and the earth was reaped. And another angel came out of the temple, which is in heaven. He also having a sharp sickle. See, I can see Joshua and them over there like, okay, I'm going to lift up this, this cluster of grapes right here. Okay, hurry up, cut it down. Now let's tie it to this pole. But what Jesus is going to do is he's going to take the whole thing back. And he's going to reap this earth for himself. Thrusting in his sickle and taking back this earth for himself. Simultaneously judging the people that refuse to live for him. And all of this is going on like a big old wine press of judgment. And grape juice is flying all over the place. Because the idea behind it is really that the blood of the people that refuse to believe. And don't feel sorry for them. I mean, you can feel sorry for your friends and your loved ones that didn't trust Christ, but don't feel sorry for, for the majority of these people because the majority of these people purposefully threw in their lot with Satan. I'm telling you right now, that's who God's judging here. The sad thing is that there's collateral damage. People that were deceived, people that refused to believe God. Right. But, the, but the real war that's going on here is that God is destroying the foe that has been destroying his creation for thousands of years. Look at this, Revelation 19, 12 through 16. This is when he's coming back. See, before we were just talking about the fact that it was going to happen and that it was going to happen. That God promised it would happen. Now we're seeing it when it happens. This is Jesus coming back. His eyes were as a flame of fire and on his head were many crowns and he had a name written that no man knew but he himself. And he was clothed with a vesture dipped in blood and his name is called the word of God. And the armies of heaven, which were in heaven, followed him upon white horses, clothed in fine linen, white and clean. Out of his mouth goes a sharp sword, and with it he will smite the nations. He shall rule them with a rod of iron. He treads the winepress of the fierceness and wrath of Almighty God. And he has on his vesture and on his thigh a name written, King of Kings and Lord of Love. Another imagery of, of a winepress of wrath. He's clothed in a vesture dipped in blood. The clothing that he's wearing is co the color of blood. It's co I mean, I, you can't take it's colored in blood because his own blood's got to be on that thing. Why? Because as the lamb, he was the sacrifice. But part of that blood is the blood of wrath, the blood of vengeance. As he comes back, how do I know? Because I just read to you all those Old Testament passages. My garments are going to be stained with the wine of the wine press. The judgment of God. Jesus is clothed in a garment that is stained with the grapes of the wine press. But Jesus is coming back to reap back this earth. Listen to me. This is his earth. Amen. This is his property. God gave it to him and God, he created it with the breath of his mouth. He spoke it into existence and he's coming back to take it. Yeah. And he's asking you and I to work with him today. Amen. That's the, that's, that was point number two. Now, this is point number three. Faithful till the end. You remember what he said right there earlier on in Hebrews 3.1? He said, Wherefore, holy brethren, partakers of the heavenly call, consider the high priest, the, the apostle and high priest of our profession. And then in Hebrews 4.14, he said, Seeing then, this is way later, right? This is like two chapters later. Seeing then we have a great high priest that is passed into the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold fast our profession. That word profession or confession, I've talked to y'all about that word before. It could be translated either way. It's homo. Better to say it that way. Logia. What does that mean? Same. Speak. Really the idea whenever we have a homologia is that we say the same thing as God. We're speaking the same thing that God speaks. What is God speaking? I got a plan. I got a plan and I got a people. I created a people and through that people I gave Jesus. And Jesus was the sacrifice to die on the cross. 
He was obedient to the Father. He was faithful to the Father. He finished the work. Amen. He's seated at the right hand of the Father. And His Word says He's coming back again. Amen. Hamalagia says, we believe the same thing God says. We believe the same thing God speaks. This is his gospel message. It doesn't matter what the world out there says. It doesn't matter what the scientists say about their evolution stuff or whatever the case. The word of the Lord says God created this with the word of his mouth. The, the Bible says that God's coming back to take what belongs to him. Hamalagia, hold fast to your profession. Hold fast to your confession. No matter how hard the times get no matter how bad the persecution may be you got to be faithful to him until he delivers in the end hey Caleb God promised you that you could have the land yes I know he did and I'm just waiting for the right time but in the meantime I gotta watch all these people die around me there was a period of time that Caleb had to wait from the promise till the fulfillment and the whole time each and every day one by one they were dropping like flies there's other places that talk. That, that, listen to me. Their bones were scorched in the Sinai sun. They didn't make it. They didn't make it to the end because they did not hold fast to their profession, their confession. And you and I, if we're going to be part of that inheritance, God has some promises waiting up ahead. Amen. Amen. He's got a rest waiting up ahead. Amen. 